This is the Psychcast by MD Edge, the official podcast of MD Edge Psychiatry. We will bring you interviews with leaders in the field of psychiatry and psychology, masterclass lectures, and relevant inspiration and clinical correlation straight to your ears. New episodes drop on Wednesdays. I'm the voice of MD Edge Podcast, Nick Andrews. Welcome to episode 119 of the Psychcast by MD Edge. I am Nick Andrews, and I'm joined, as I always am, by Dr. Lorenzo Norris. And Dr. Norris, we start this episode with a, a little bit of a disclosure. If you are a listener who listens in the first 72 hours after the episode drops, like most of you do, um, we want you to know that there's going to be a bonus episode where there's a much more in-depth discussion regarding everything happening in the United States in late spring of 2020 as it pertains to some protests. And Dr. Norris, I welcome you in to say that, you know, just ask how you're doing and how your patients are doing and, and you know, what's going on. Well, Nick, one, always good to talk with you. And um, it, it's, again, the term is overused, but we are truly in unprecedented times. Um, we are going to have a much more in-depth conversation about this, but you always ask how I'm doing. And I can only tell you that right now, um, I'm focused on keeping my strength for uh, my patients, my family, everybody I represent, uh, because we are, we're seeing things that we have, I mean, uh, that are just shocking, absurd, um, absurd isn't even the word, brutal, cruel, um, frightening uh, on any level that you want to imagine. How is this affecting uh, people? Uh, it's affecting everybody. For those of you who do not know, I am um, actually in. Uh, I work at uh, uh, George Washington University, uh, and I am in our nation's capital. Um, and this has been uh, a truly stunning turn of events. Um, I could not have predicted this. Um, people are shocked. People are hurt. And I mean, patients, physicians, um, everybody in the DMV area that I can see, um, people are in a great deal of pain. And I have seen this pain continue and continue to progress, particularly with the events that occurred um, on the evening of um June 1st in particular, which we're going to get into, uh, I would imagine in our more in-depth podcast. So, um, if you, if you ask me how people are doing, Nick, um, they're in pain. However, they are trying to maintain hope and push forward, but I cannot articulate to you how, um, painful this is, particularly for the, um, African American community. Um, but offer, but for all of us in general, because humanity is just humanity. Um, so, but we'll talk about this, uh, at the, uh, in, in more in depth, more in depth, to say Absolutely. the least. Absolutely. And so for the most part, you and I sort of do this little intro and then we kick it to an interview segment. I'm going to be uh, participating a little bit more when we do our bonus emergency episode. And by that time, you like to think that maybe things will have, have calmed down. We're going to re be recording that around the time that this episode will, will drop. If you're someone who stumbled on this episode a little later, our in-depth emergency episode will be labeled bonus and it will be episode 120. I can just say from, from where I sit, I'm, I'm a much more introverted person. I do a lot more reflection, I think philosophically and ideologically. And my, my big message is, is always been like this, this is very bad throughout human history, there have been worse. I think the worst thing that could happen w would be for this to amount to nothing. One small step uh, in, 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 a, in a particular direction is a good thing. You know, don't try to take it all at once, but remember this moment and, and move forward slowly instead of moving backward. And I, I think that's sort of what I'm trying to take out of it. I don't know, tell anyone else what to do, but that's well, I, I, well, Nick, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, um, and I know we're probably supposed to wait until uh, the more in-depth no, episode, no, right. but I, I can't help but comment on that because I do agree because this is exceedingly overwhelming. This is incredibly overwhelming. And I would encourage anyone listening there, um, you, you're going to, I know I do, um, you're going to maybe want to try to tackle racism, social determinants of health, injustice, all of this all at once. And that is, no matter how well-meaning that is, that we are going to get just possibly exhausted even just thinking about it or scared or take whatever language you want. 
I do believe though that this this absolutely must uh, will and has already amounted to something. But for me, as an example, one thing that I'm focused on is um, police brutality and abuse of power. Um, yeah. You know, and what do we actually start to look at and think about that in particular? Um, and as a person who works in a hospital and uh, has the honor of working with security personnel at GW hospital, as an example, um, restraining can turn into assault very quickly. All right. So sure. I have some very strong views about that, but again, I would encourage folks, let's, let's first chop off what we can actually maybe handle right now and keep the focus on police brutality as well as abuse of power. And, um, hopefully, Medscape or whoever's listening to this right now will be okay with it uh, because I really have no other way other than to say it other than that. I think anything else is sugarcoating it. Yeah. Uh, um, and there's no other, and I could use much stronger language. And I think that's about as toned of a language that I can use. So. If you do go into that language, we'll have to label this as explicit, but that won't be a big deal. I think that's, you know, it's warranted for those kind of things. Um, we're going to get into that. And I, I like to think that I can ask some intelligent questions and, we're going to get it. We're going to get into that. And uh, from the viewpoint of the physician, from the viewpoint of the psychiatrist, and uh, I think really important, the, the, the viewpoint of the prominent black physician, which you, of course, are. And who do you represent and, and, and what is your role or your cross to bear, if you will, in moments like this? So all of that's happening in, in episode 120. And we encourage everyone to tune in. Uh, we're very proud of diversity here. Small wins at MD Edge in our interview. This week actually is the first time we've ever had three African-American physicians as hosts at the same time. That's very encouraging. And this, is, of course, is a crossover episode, which we love to do cross promotion. It's shameless stuff. It is what it is. We found a way to link dermatology and psychiatry. And this is about, uh, interestingly, dermatology has been roped into the COVID-19 pandemic uh, with a bunch of interesting manifestations. So how are our dermatologists doing with their mental health? Well, Dr. Kandris Heath, who is a co-host and a, and a sometimes host on Dermatology Weekly, she interviewed you and Dr. Nicole Washington about physician mental health and how that pertains to two specialties, psychiatry and dermatology. And it sounded like you and Dr. Washington had a pretty good time talking to Dr. Heath. Yeah, no, Dr. Washington and I had a great time talking to Dr. Heath. It was my first time talking to Dr. Heath, and I was really, really, really um, in. It, Love the conversation. I want people to listen to this podcast because Dr. Washington had hit some really important, like practical points in regards to your health and things that you need. I love the way in which she weaved it together. And Dr. Heath, look, I just want to do another podcast with her when I can just kind of get it all together. Because our dermatologists out there, all of us, they are under, people underestimate the level of stress that like um, dermatologists are under with COVID-19. Uh, again, but because think about this, dermatology, uh, all of us in terms of physical exam, but skin, touch manifest uh, physical manifest uh if you will dermatological manifestations of COVID-19 so I mean I, we could do one of these for every area or field but I absolutely appreciate it um that it is you know uh, in terms of the, being able to do this crossover episode um with dermatology and just being able to work with my colleagues and just interact with them so that was very cool yeah, and one thing I thought as someone who does production work for, for this kind of stuff, I, I thought that we need to get multiple specialties in a room because you never know. You know how you're different. That's so obvious, and this you know goes back right. to some of our conversations we'll have in our emergency episode about race relations in the United States. But you know how you're different. That's observable. But you don't think about how you're the same. And what I learned through COVID-19 is dermatology and psychiatry are the two most woke specialties on telemedicine. You guys are way mm -hmm. ahead of where everyone else has been. And I found that really interesting in this conversation as well. All right. Well, that's cool. That's cool. That is cool. Well, yeah. So I want everyone to listen to this one. I mean, I think this is, um, it's a great episode and it's also, as you said, it's nice that we have this, but this is now, where am I going with it? This is how we need to be thinking about in terms of, in, how, as we move forward in medicine, this integrated, if you will, approach where we are doing this cross, I mean, this cross fertilization, um, you may notice that actually this theme of cross fertilization or us acting together as opposed to separate in silos that's going to come up in a lot of places including what we're dealing with in this in our country right now so i'm glad that md edge is actually leading this and along with everything that you're doing nick oh, and gina sure. and jeff in terms of as well as medscape and trying to really think about as i think i, I may have mentioned this on a podcast before or someplace else i'm not sure but a new normal needs a new paradigm 
Yes. So we need to do that. Yes, and speaking of that, following the interview portion of the show, Dr. Renee Kohansky will be back. She wants to talk about expectations and how you can interact with your patients if you remove expectations. And do you, as a patient or as a physician or just as a human, have a right to feel a certain way? And what if you put yourself in someone else's shoes or just change the expectation? A brilliantly poignant thought from Dr. Renee Kohansky in a case study from a patient. That, of course, is coming up after our interview. Look, I, I love RK stuff. I mean, Nick, when, when are RK and I going to do a podcast, man? Yeah, like, whatever you want. Hey, 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 hey. Like, we'll have like a corporate retreat or something. We'll, we'll get a castle in Germany or something and we'll make, <laughs> yeah, we'll make it happen. Don't worry about it. I got you. It's not going to be a okay. problem. Yeah, don't worry about it. That's, of course, Dr. RK coming up after our interview. Well, Dr. Norris, uh, you and I have a big conversation to have in the next 72 hours. That will drop immediately, episode 120. If you're listening to this, we are going to address the situation in the United States. Episode 120, when it comes out, check your feed. Until then, we have been planning this because this is important. Um, there's still a pandemic. I see all these mass gatherings and protests, and I'm kind of freaking out about it. That's the secondary aspect of all this. There may Absolutely. have been one murder, maybe 50,000, so we'll... The only history, you know, time will tell. So we want to address that right now. And so we're going to stay on course uh, with this conversation between Dr. Kandris Heath, Dr. Lorenzo Norris, and our uh, most recent guest on Dermatology Weekly and, psych- and the Psychcast, uh, Dr. Nicole Washington. So Dr. Norris, um, I, you know, stay, feel how you feel. Black Lives Matter. And, and thank you so much for joining me this week. Joining me are two psychiatrists today, Dr. Lorenzo Norris from George Washington University in Washington, D.C., who is also the host of the MD Edge Psychcast, and Dr. Nicole Washington, who is Chief Medical Officer of Elosin Psychiatric Services, a telemedicine practice providing care to physicians and other professionals around the country. Thank you both for joining me today. Glad to be here. Great to be here, Dr. Heath. Yeah, thank you for having me. So, you know, over the last several years, many people across a variety of careers have begun to really publicly acknowledge the importance of mental health. Unfortunately, as you know, intimately, in the physician population, there are still a lot of taboos about talking about our own mental health. Dr. Washington, when physicians finally do seek help with you, what are some of the mental health disorders that you are seeing frequently in your physician population? Well, as with the general population, anxiety disorders are by far the most common disorders that we see. And I do see quite a bit of anxiety and depression in uh, the physicians that I take care of, as well as substance use issues. And Dr. Norris, do you have anything to add to that? Well, absolutely. I mean, those conditions in terms of depression, anxiety spectrum disorders, but particularly substance use disorders, these are the things that we're actually seeing in the physician population. I want to put a particular point on, if you will, the unipolar depression, as well as the substance use, because we know that those two things in regards, that's just a very lethal cocktail. And I would say even before we start to see depression, as well as substance use, we have to be vigilant to, for lack of a better word, syndromes of distress. You can conceptualize this as a bit overused now, but it has a certain relevance or teeth to it, burnout. The other concept that I think actually has a lot of utility is demoralization. A good way to think about it for me is that burnout and demoralization are either precursors or pre-syndromal to depression and substance use. So we need to really be intervening at an earlier stage before we let physicians get to the point, if, if possible, to the point of either having a unipolar depression or substance use. And I thought Dr. Washington did a very good job also of highlighting anxiety because we're really, what's the bottom line? Uh, Physicians have a higher rate of suicide than the general population. And the association with anxiety, as opposed to depression, anxiety is a really big deal when it comes to not only suicidal ideation, but completed suicide. So most of our listeners are going to be dermatologists and are dermatologists, so dermatologists to be You mentioned unipolar depression. Can you explain a little bit more about what that is? Absolutely. Unipolar depression, that's just my way of saying major depressive disorder. All right. Um, Ah, okay. There's major depressive disorder. There's bipolar disorder. Um, Depending on who you talk to, um, there's a lot of different ways to conceptualize it, affective spectrum disorders. But I'd say unipolar depression specifically for that reason that it's major depressive disorder. So you you can use those two terms interchangeably. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you for that. You know, we're dermatologists, so we don't often 
speak in those terms, but uh, thank you so much for educating us about that. So you mentioned physician suicide. Again, another taboo topic that is definitely making headlines right now, as there have been a number of physicians who have committed suicide, which really, I think, is more of an ultimate cry for help than anything else. Can you give us an idea of how prevalent this physician suicide may be? And the key word that you said, Dr. Heath, is can I give you an idea? Because that's the best I can do. I can only give you an idea. We estimate that roughly about 300 to 400 physicians commit suicide every year, but that's just an estimate because we really don't know. We don't know the numbers because we've just, it's very difficult to track or to report, but that would be the estimate. So what does that usually equate to? That equates to two large medical school classes. One thing that I usually tell folks that I, when I think about physician suicide, the graduating classes of Howard, GW, and Georgetown would place all the physicians that die by suicide every year. That kind of gives everybody an idea of the magnitude of this problem. When we're talking about physician suicide, we can talk about suicide rates. We can say that male physicians are 1.41 times higher than the general male population to commit suicide. And in our female physician population, they have a 2.27 increased risk of suicide. So the unfortunate thing about this is that we can only give estimates in regards to the true prevalence of suicide. We can say that the syndromes that uh, Dr. Washington pointed out, uh, whether it's major depressive disorder, well, it's generalized anxiety disorder, whether it's substance use disorders, we're having a better, better appreciation of what those numbers are. But physician suicide has been certainly a problem. It's been on the rise, and I would dare say it has actually paralleled what we are seeing in this country, where we've had an increasing level of suicide rates for a decade plus. So as our patients go, physicians have gone too. That is really definitely eye-opening. Dr. Washington, I know that one of your areas of expertise is around physician mental health specifically. What would you like to uh, share about physician suicide? I think that's a great thing for us to remind ourselves is that this is a guess and an estimate and that three to 400 number, we think we're in the ballpark. And one of the things I, I try to get people to think through, if there are that many who actually complete How many more are there who walk around with the thoughts daily who don't complete? How many are there who we don't include in the numbers that we have as far as the anxiety and depression and substance use? Because that relies on either them admitting to it or seeking treatment for it. Um, So the numbers, I think, are much larger. And I think that we are guessing a lot when it comes to this because it's just not something that we have been able to put our fingers on and come up with firm numbers for. We can actually just think about this. Just think about this. We know if we look at the national data in the U.S. on suicide rates that there's roughly, I'm going to say, 30 suicide attempts per completed suicide. So if we take that 300 or 400 number that Dr. Washington just talked about and she just laid it out for you, that's 9,000. That's 9,000 attempts. So 9,000 people would have attempted and 300 to 400 would have completed. I mean, so yeah, that's, that brings to the scope of the problem. And I mean, since this is a dermatology podcast, which is good, we just had a number of medical students graduate entering into the field of dermatology. I haven't actually looked at the numbers, but I'm just kind of curious just how many dermatologists are actually out there practicing. There are about 14,000 dermatologists in practice right now. So about 14,000 dermatologists in practice right now. So if Dr. Washington and I's crude calculation is correct, are you sitting here telling me that like approximately, it would be the equivalent of more than half of the dermatologists in practice making a suicide attempt? I mean, that's that's what it is. Like just so people can like put their mind around it. That's, imagine half of all your colleagues making a suicide attempt. Because sometimes the numbers, we got to put the visual to it. And I think when you do that, then all of a sudden, if I don't care what field you're in. When you say that, no, that's not acceptable. We got to do something about that. And we got to do something about it now. Yes, I think that's a great comparison, definitely, to think about losing that many colleagues to suicide. That, that is massive. Speaking of colleagues, you know, every day in the news, we hear about healthcare workers and what they're doing on the front lines. What should physicians on the front lines really be doing right now? during COVID-19, the pandemic, to protect their mental health? 
Now, first off, there's a lot of great information out there in regards to the stressors of pandemics, the stressors of quarantine, and our colleagues, whether folks in the Department of Defense or the VA, they've done a lot of work on this. And I would encourage people to look at some of the guidelines that have been released in regards to PTSD. But I think one of the first things that people can do in terms of their own mental health is you got to know the stressors. You got to know the stressors and you got to know the time frame. All right. Now, depending on what you consider COVID-19, you can use a disaster response model. Okay, this has been put out there before, but there's usually, if you will, anywhere from four to five phases of it. I'm going to say pre-disaster, impact, heroic, honeymoon, disillusionment, and reconstruction. All right, so you got to know what phase you're in. Another simple way to do this is, are you surging, are you plateauing, are you peaking, or are you going down? All right, that's kind of another simple way to do it. And then once you know that, once you know where you're at, then you have to know the main areas of stress that people are going to face. One is going to be your biosecurity. A good way to think about that is like PPE, physical strain, and the level to be constant awareness of. The next stress you're going to face or category is going to be risk of disease transmission. And then the other stressor that you're going to have is balancing the multiple medical and personal demand stressors. Because, you know, many of us in this era now, we can go into telehealth and things of that nature. We're trying to balance homeschooling. We're trying to balance our own life with our own family members. We're balancing a lot of different things. But when all of those things come together that can become a great difficulty. So again, the way I think about it is where are you at? Do you understand what particular stressors affect you? And then clearly making being proactive about your mental health. That's just kind of a broad overview in terms of how you can start to think about it. Dr. Washington, what would you say are some of the things that, you know, the the doctors and the healthcare workers who are on the front lines during this COVID pandemic, what are some of the things that you are telling your patients? We are working on two main goals. The one thing we talk about constantly is controlling the things that we can control. In medicine, we are used to trying to control every little detail and know everything we can ahead of time. And this is just not something that any of us have been prepared for. So the uncertainty, the lack of control is really, really affecting a lot of us negatively, understandably so. And so focusing a lot of energy on things that you have no control over lead to a lot of anxiety and you feeling stressed and you feeling more fatigued and you feeling more defeated. Um, And so we focus a lot on what are those things that you have control over about your day? What are those things that you can control? We look back at what are those things that have helped you make it through tough, stressful times in the past? And can we use some of those same things to help you now? Which of those things are not effective that we need to replace? And so we do focus on that. And then we we focus to getting to that final phase of that reconstruction or that acceptance, right? When you think about the five stages of grief or whether you're looking, you know, at other models, getting to that acceptance is where you can then go, okay, I've made it through the other phases. I have a clearer picture of where I am, where I need to go, and what it takes for me to get there. It may not be a perfect situation. It may not be something I anticipated, but now that we're here, how do I take acceptance of the situation I'm in, and how do I try to move forward without it completely taking me down? And Dr. Washington, if you can go on to add some comments about Some of the things that physicians who are not on the front lines, how can they be mentally impacted by the COVID epidemic? I think there's a lot of focus on those who are on the front lines who are really risking their lives, their families' lives, all of that. But what about those other physicians in the background? What's happening with their mental health and how do you think that the COVID pandemic has impacted them? A lot of physicians are facing financial difficulty, whether you're frontline or not. And a lot of those uh, physicians who are in private practices or you're in a different specialty and you're not necessarily frontline, um, a lot of those doctors are seeing pay cuts or furloughs because they aren't bringing in the same revenue that they brought in because everybody's staying at home and nobody's coming in and we've restricted you know, a lot of contact. And so the the financial stress that a lot of people are seeing is taking a toll. I've seen quite a few physicians who their financial security questions are now creating some anxiety that wasn't there before. And so that's part of it. I'm also seeing surprisingly, because this isn't something that I anticipated seeing, I'm seeing physicians who are feeling guilty 
they are feeling as if they're watching their peers, you know, jump in and be in the game and in it. And they're just kind of sitting on the bench and they, I've had multiple physicians talk about the guilt that they feel or feeling as if they aren't doing enough and really being harder on themselves about their lack of action on the front lines. And that is affecting their mental health as well. Wow, that's definitely quite a concept. Dr. Norris, what do you have to add? I agree, actually, with everything that Dr. Washington said. The economic impact is very real. Many groups or institutions at at this point in time are really having to make very difficult decisions. So Dr. Washington was absolutely accurate, in my humble opinion, with that. I would say I am seeing a bit of the guilt. I certainly also am seeing that from our wheelhouse here in GW um, in regards to maybe they should be doing more. And then the other thing I would say that I think that, because it's interesting that we use this frontline concept, I think that there are those that are on, like, seeing COVID patients. I mean, I I certainly am in the hospital seeing COVID patients, but many of my colleagues, even though they're not necessarily seeing COVID patients, their workloads have increased tremendously. It's weird. It's like the volume has gone down, but the stress of everything and meetings and constant information and education has gone up. So... I kind of like to think sometimes COVID is everywhere and it just kind of depends on how in which shape or form you have to deal with. And why do I bring that up? I think that that, there's the guilt, but I also think that can get underappreciated. The amount of work that people are doing to really keep, for lack of a better word, maybe the outpatient division afloat. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that all of those are great points as well uh, about physicians, uh, not necessarily directly dealing with the COVID happening on the day-to-day basis at the hospital, but all of those other things that they're doing and now that they're responsible for, that does, you know, take a toll on them. So it it is definitely okay to acknowledge that, uh, that change in your life. And speaking of life changes, over the years, I've often read these surveys about, you know, which specialty physicians are the happiest and most content. And often dermatologists top the list or in the top three or four of all physician specialties that are among the happiest. Then COVID happened. And I'm sensing that there's definitely some stress going on, even in the dermatology community. So what can dermatologists do? to protect their mental health during this pandemic, especially considering all of the other things that you said to answer the previous question. Dr. Norris, you want to dive into that one? I guess I would start with the idea. I mean, the first thing that I think about is it gets at the idea of what Dr. Washington was getting at, um, control. Know what it Mm -hmm. is you can or cannot control. I think knowledge is very powerful in terms of educating yourself in terms of what to expect. That's what I was talking about. The biggest thing in terms of people protecting themselves, I don't, whether it's a dermatologist or anyone else, I think that it's still the same stuff. Being willing to reach out and get assistance. Um, If I had to pick one thing, really be mindful of yourself and where you're at and do not hesitate to reach out and get assistance, professional assistance, even if you don't feel it, but if you were under financial distress, if you were under a great deal of of the rest, I really think the biggest thing is to actually reach out and get professional help. I, to me, that's the, one of the number one barriers in regards to physicians is that they do everything too late. They try to control everything, including themselves. So to me, the biggest thing dermatologists can do, and any physician for that matter, I mean, we can maybe get a bit more specific, but I have to start with reaching out. I just have to. And being honest about where you're at. Being honest and reaching out. Yes, I guess it's the same concept of putting your own oxygen mask on first to say, oh, there's a problem. I need to take care of myself. And then moving on to the other things. Dr. Washington, do you have anything to add? I do. I think for, you know, you hit the nail on the head earlier when you talked about in all these surveys, dermatologists are seen as the happiest. And I, you know, I think in medicine, dermatologists have a certain, you know, there's a certain reputation that goes with being a dermatologist and, you know, people make their jokes about, man, they got it made. And, you know, you make all your jokes about uh, different specialties, but I think dermatologists specifically, because they have historically been a specialty 
that is, you know, well compensated and they tend to be happier and the lifestyle, you know, is, is there. I think those doctors are at increased risk of feeling guilty about even pursuing treatment because they think, well, what do I have to be bothered? For because I really do have it good. You know, like they feel bad about even saying that they're having a hard time right now when in reality, we should all just be feeling whatever it is we're feeling. Like feel your feelings, figure it out and reach out and don't let your circumstances or what you think people see as your circumstances stop you from reaching out. Yes, I think that's great advice. Dr. Norris, did you have something else to say? I heard you. No, I was, no, nah, I was just nodding enthusiastically. Absolutely. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, yeah, that's the truth. Yeah, absolutely. No, preach on. No, say that again. I mean, you know, that's Washington put it out there for you. No doubt. <laughs> so now everybody has a new normal. No one is excluded in the world. We all have a new normal. So for physicians, the transition to this new normal can be a unique one. So do you have any words of advice for physicians in general transitioning to this new normal, whatever that may be for them? Their practice is not going to be the same for a long time, and it may never go back to how it was before. So talk about just the unique impact of the world's new normal on physician. I don't, Dr. Norris, do you want to take that one first? Sure. I'll jump into that one. I mean, I just got really two words for folks, uh, radical acceptance. It's a term used uh, frequently. It's a part of DBT therapy. It's something that I firmly believe in. I'm with the people there. It's a new normal. I mean, you know, you go home, you work and like who knew homeschooling could be so hard. I mean, it's rough. It's real. It's not. Yeah. I see people not. Yeah. It's, it's tough. I mean, you know, who knew ge- geometry is hard, man. Uh, so is history and all that stuff. <laughs> but, you know, you think about this and I'm with my family and they're like, okay, yeah, you know, I can't wait till we get back to school. I'm like, uh, I'm not so sure about that. Maybe you will, maybe you won't, maybe it'll be a hybrid. But if we stay in a state of denial and we keep trying to think that it's going to go back to what it was, that's just not going to be adaptive. I mean, one of my attendings had a saying that, you know, uh, reality is your friend and it's the only thing that's going to help you. So for me, you just have to, in terms of that new normal, you have to radically accept it. And what does that mean? That means you don't judge it. That doesn't mean you have to like it. It doesn't mean you have to feel one way about it, but you have to just accept it for what it is. And once you do that, then I think you're in a better position. Otherwise you're going to just suffer. And Dr. Washington, what advice would you give? I, you know, I think you're right that both professionally and personally, we are going to see a lot of new normals and transitions. And I, I think it's important for us to show ourselves a level of grace. You know, I see physicians who are trying to be, you know, the homeschool teacher plus the summer camp counselor and the, you know, they're trying to cover all the extracurriculars and still take care of their patients. And, you know, there there will come a point where I think we will have to show ourselves some grace and realize that there are going to be some days where we don't do as well as we think we should do because we all have very high expectations for ourselves. We would never have gotten to the point where we are in our careers if we did not. And so this is going to really hit us in a place where we're going to have to accept the fact that we are not superheroes and we are human and we have limitations and our expectations of ourselves are really going to have to, you know, be put in check here in the next several months. (laughs) I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that. Um, And I just want to close by saying thank you so much to our guests Dr. Lorenzo Norris and Dr. Nicole Washington for discussing mental health on our special COVID conversation series. I am your guest host, Dr. Kendra Peet. Be safe and be well, both physically and mentally. And that concludes this special crossover interview portion of our show. Big thanks to Dr. Kandras Heath of Dermatology Weekly for joining the Psychcast, and a big thanks to Dr. Nicole Washington for doing both Derm Weekly and the Psychcast. The Psychcast by MD Edge will be right back after this.
Welcome back to the Sidecast by MD Edge. I am Nick Andrews. It's time now for Dr. RK, Dr. Renee Kohansky. I have to tell you, I really do enjoy your back and forth repartee with Dr. Norris. It's so much fun to listen to. So as I've said many times, we are truly privileged to do the work we do. Recently, I was digging in with patient TZ, and I mean really getting in there with him. And for the record, we were doing this in telemedicine. So I'll I'll digress for one second. For this work, I truly would have preferred if we were doing this live and in person, but it wasn't an option. And interestingly, as we were getting in there, the screen vanished. Anyways, we were in the trenches with some powerful stuff, and we were in familiar territory painful, unresolved issues from the past that impact the present. Historical, ontological material for him. We've been here before. I know the circuit. If we had the capability of an fMRI, I could predict the neurologic pathway that would light up. He was discussing his younger brother, whom he's never been able to save, and ultimately this younger brother had succumbed to a life of addiction. We discussed his codependency role and our usual dialogue. Then he said to me, well, you know how my younger brother is and you know what that does to me. So I decided to break our usual course and the conversation deviated. I said, let's pretend we don't know how your brother is and actually let's act like we don't know anything. Let's just say all we know right now is that he's acting from a place of addiction. Somewhere underneath that addiction behavior may or may not be your brother. But what we have is addiction behavior behavior that has one goal and that has taken over your brother. What if your job is to not interact with those behaviors at all? So TZ asked, so I'm not supposed to get all pissed off when my brother asks for money? So I ask you, my colleagues, why is he pissed? Well, he's pissed because he has all these expectations about what his brother should or shouldn't be, do, ask, etc., based on something from the past. And that's where our conversation deviated. See, in order for him to have any hope of something different with his brother now, he has to let go of those expectations. He actually has no right to any expectations. This is psychology and addiction 101, but in a profound way. I'm not prescribing any particular school of thought here. Obviously, there are many technologies to help manage addictions and codependencies. I'm just talking about letting go of what you think someone is and accepting what you have in front of you. Letting go of your right to an expectation. So if TZ has no right to an expectation that the person in front of him is going to act like what he thinks his brother of younger years should act, it gives him an awful lot of freedom. Or he could go another way. He could actually say to himself, my brother is currently consumed with addiction behavior of course he's going to ask me for money what else would he do and his then his response wouldn't be anger it would be oh yes that's naturally what's going to happen this may sound all very simplistic but it's actually quite impactful and you'd be amazed at what is uncovered when we truly listen to how divergent people's expectations are to what's the reality sitting in front of them. I'm the continually confronting, reality testing, Dr. Renee Kohansky for the MD Edge Sidecast. And thank you, Dr. RK. No one has the right to an expectation of profound thought for all of us. That concludes this episode of the Sidecast. Episode 119 of the Psychcast is executive produced, hosted by the editor-in-chief of MDH Psychiatry, Dr. Lorenzo Norris. Dr. Norris was a guest on a crossover episode in this week's interview portion of the show. The interviewing physician was Dr. Kandris Heath, including Dr. Lorenzo Norris and Dr. Nicole Washington. The Psychcast is produced by MDH editors Gina Henderson and Jeff Bauer. All MDH Psychcasts are produced by the editor-in-chief of MDH and Medscape, Dr. Ivan Aransky along with MD Edge executive editors Mary Ellen Schneider and Kathy Scarbeck and multimedia editor Terry Rudd. The show notes are authored by Dr. Jacqueline Posada. All social media is produced by Kyla Clark. I am your audio engineer, audio editor, and the host of the MD Edge Sidecast, Nick Andrews.